Okay, in this special topic, we are going to talk about George Kelly's personal constructs theory. This topic would be very helpful for my students both in personality psychology as well as in cognitive psychology because this perspective allows us to appreciate personality from the cognitive perspective. Okay, and it's important for you to understand this theory if you would like to understand other people from cognitive perspective. And this will allow us to understand what are the things that will influence a certain person in maintaining or changing his belief. Okay, because as we know from different personality theories, a person is unhealthy if he or she keeps on believing in the same thing, even though that belief is no longer helpful. Okay, so what we're trying to say here is that a person is going to be considered healthy if he or she can change his belief if it's necessary to do so. And that's what Kelly is talking about in his theory called personal constructs theory. Okay, so let me give you an overview of personal constructs theory. So Kelly believes that he can describe personality in terms of cognitive processes. And when we learn how to do this, we are capable of interpreting behaviors and events and of using this understanding to guide our behavior and even to predict the behavior of other people. So what I like about personal construct theory is that ever since I learned how to use this theory, this allowed me to understand a lot of behaviors from a cognitive perspective. And I try to use this theory every day of my life. And learning this theory is very helpful in understanding why do people keep on believing in their beliefs okay and why is it hard to change belief from time to time and why do we do behavior such as discrimination or prejudice or why do we take certain shortcuts when we think you will learn those things when we get to the actual theory so what i want you to do is that i want you also to create your own examples in order for you to understand personal constructs theory because examples are the most helpful thing in understanding personal construct theory. When I was a student, what I tried is that I have read the material or the reading about personal construct theory. Then after that, I tried my best to think of an example for every proposition of Kelly. Because Kelly had 11 propositions, he had 11 corollaries in understanding human behavior and these are not so easy to understand that's why what I did is that the the examples that I have been able to compile all these years I will include them in this discussion so that you'll be able to understand what is it that Kelly is talking about even though he used complex terms and complex language in explaining his theory once you understand the examples you will learn that it's not so complex after all okay and once you understand this theory you'll be able to understand your own behavior as well as predict the behavior of other people from a cognitive perspective okay because in layman's term what kelly is saying is that as people we do follow certain patterns in what we do and there are instances where in our experiences will tell us that we need to change our pattern but not all people are healthy enough to change their pattern of behaviors. That's why they tend to be unhealthy. Okay, so with that, let's talk about the specifics of Kelly's personal construct theory. Okay, so Kelly believed that people are scientists. Okay, and what do scientists do? So like a researcher, what we do is that we take a logical approach and understanding the world and we try to adapt hypothesis theories in how we understand the world and we try to test these hypotheses against real life okay and what do healthy researchers do or what do healthy people do what do healthy scientists do is that when they encounter counterfactual evidence they try to modify their theories or their beliefs in a healthy way so a scientist will not keep on claiming something that has already been disproven because that is unhealthy okay what if until today you still think that people get sick because they are cursed what if you you're still saying that people are diagnosed with with 
problems in the lungs or in the brain or in the skin because that is a punishment from the gods and goddesses. Well, that's not being a responsible scientist, okay? And you need to change your belief. So Kerry suggested that people perceive and organize their world. There's an emphasis in the word their world because we all have our own perceptions of the world, okay? So we have our own way of seeing things and that constitutes our world of experiences, okay? The same way that scientists do. By formulating hypotheses about the environment and testing them against the reality of life, in other words, we observe the events of our life, the facts or the data of our experience and interpret them in our own way. So there's no single objective way of interpreting data, but like a researcher in doing results and discussion, he may have his own biases in interpreting the data so that the data will fit into his theories of, or hypotheses. Okay, so you need to be responsible enough in forming your beliefs. At the same time, you should be healthy as well in your environment because your environment helps you in forming those beliefs. So this is how we differ with each other. What if you grew up in an environment that is so challenging that you believe that the world is a cruel place? On the other hand, there are people who are lucky enough to believe that the world is a healthy place to live in. Hence, we differ with each other in the way that we see things and the way that we try to interpret what is going to happen in the future. Okay, so basically we do adapt our own personal beliefs and we try to interpret everything in a way that it will fit with our own beliefs. So speaking about beliefs, Kelly believed that we have our own constructs or in layman's term, beliefs, okay? You construe the world or you believe that something happens in a way that you want to interpret it. So an in, a construct is an intellectual hypothesis. It's a theory, it's a hypothesis that we devise and use to interpret and explain events. Say, for example, your construct is that people get sick because of malfunctions in the body. Or your construct can be people get sick because they're being punished, okay? So we have our own beliefs and we have our own constructs and these constructs guide our experience so we can modify them if we need to, okay? And there are different factors that allow us to understand that our beliefs are no longer consistent and we're going to discuss that. And later on, you will learn more from this that our constructs are bipolar or dichotomous meaning we understand the opposite side of our beliefs in order for it to be useful. In an example, our beliefs is not only we don't only know the meaning of tall, we also know the meaning of short. We also know, on the other hand, if we use the word honest, you also know the meaning of the word dishonest. So in every belief that we have, we know that it has an opposite. Later on, we are going to talk more about that. Other than that, we also have to take note of what we call constructive alternativism which says that the idea that we are free to revise or replace our constructs with alternatives as needed. So in other words, our problems do not come from our childhood experiences because unlike Freud, Kelly believes that we can change our view of things whenever we need to do so. So just like Adler who believes that we are capable of changing our style of life, Kelly believes that we are capable of changing our constructs or our interpretation of the world. So now let's take a look at the 11 corollaries or the 11 propositions of George Kelly in how we interpret the world. Okay, And I would like to discuss them in a way that it will make sense. I know that these corollaries are organized in a certain way in the books that you read, but I reorganize them in a way that it would be easy for my students to understand them, okay? And I try to connect the dots as much as possible so that it will not be confusing. So the first corollary or the first proposition of George Kelly is that he believes in construction corollary. So what is construction? He believes that because repeated events are similar, we can predict what will happen in the future. In other words, your thinking or your belief of the present and the future is influenced by the past, okay? And our past experiences are very crucial 
in helping us formulate our constructs. Okay, and how do we formulate our constructs? And how, or in other words, how do we construct our constructs? That's why it's called construction. It's about building your own beliefs. Okay, so here are the beliefs, some of the beliefs that you may have, okay, that I think you have constructed as you grow older or as you learn through elementary or grade school, as you learn until you're in college, you do learn that people believe, behave in a certain way. Say, for example, as human beings, we believe that helping is good. We believe that disasters are scary. Why? Because you have experienced disasters before and they're in fact scary. So in other words, your previous experiences help you create beliefs about what's going to happen in the present or in the future. So if you see someone struggling and you want to help them, you do so because you believe that helping is good. And if there's an incoming disaster, you're anxious because you believe that disasters are scary. Or in other words, let's talk about more shallow things such as Whenever you hear the, the message alert from your phone, you believe that there's a new message because you will not hear the alert from your phone unless there's a new message. So we try to, you know, connect experiences to each other, just like conditioning. Okay, if you hear the bell, then it's lunch break. Or you can have more personal beliefs such as I'm good at mathematics. Why? Because all your life you have been good in mathematics. Of course, this is a belief that will not be held by someone who is not good at math. Okay, and other beliefs such as we eat lunch at 12, we eat dinner at 6, we eat breakfast at 6 in the morning. Okay, and how do we form these beliefs? We, per we form these beliefs through our past experiences. Okay, so let's talk about more basic beliefs. Like you know that in the night it's dark and in the day it's bright. Okay, or sunny. Okay, so those are examples of construction. And you may not be totally conscious about your constructs because not all beliefs are conscious. Some of them may be unconscious. What if you believe that, okay, what if you believe that all criminals are bad? Then that help explain why is it that you despise criminals. Have you, are you conscious about it? Maybe you're not so conscious about it in the present, but because I bring it up, you were able to become conscious about it. So we will talk more about that. Do we need to revise the construct or do we need to keep it? Okay, we will. you will know more as we go along. So basically, the main idea of the first one is that you create your own beliefs. You create your own way to view the world and construct According to Kelly, they're like lenses in how you view the world. They're like shades or eyeglasses that if you wear shades that are colored black, then you're supposed to see everything in a dark manner. So you would say that all people are, are bad, all people are, all people are evil, etc. So be careful on the constructs that you have. That's why you need to be conscious about them. Okay, what about your prejudice? Do you think that all religious people are good and all non-religious people are bad? So think of your constructs right now and it, this might be the best time for you to look at your constructs because as we move along, we're going to test your beliefs. Here is the second, here's the second corollary or proposition of George Kelly is that he believes in experience corollary, which means that Yes, you constructed your belief, but along the way, your belief will be tested, okay, by your life experiences. So there are experiences that will challenge your belief, that will make you think, should I change my belief? Should I cling to my belief? Etc. So say, for example, your belief is that stealing is bad, but there are experiences. Say, for example, what if there was a disaster in your hometown and you had to steal for you to be able to eat? Hence, it will challenge your belief and you will ask the question, is it bad to steal if I'm hungry or if I'm starving? Next is that, so you believe that hurting someone or killing someone is a crime. But because of your recent experience, you ask yourself, is it a crime if I kill, if I am defending myself? Okay, so in other words, life experiences challenge our beliefs. So, what if you're from a conservative country and you believe that being separated from your partner is a sin, especially if you're married? 
But what if your partner is abusive or what if he's not psychologically capable of handling a relationship and then you get an annulment or a divorce? So you will challenge your belief that if I'm separated, is it always a sin? Okay, so basically what you learn from your childhood is changing as you grow older and you learn to challenge your own beliefs in a healthy way. Or let's talk about these. Or look at the last example here. Let's talk about lying. So lying is bad, but what about white lies? Is it bad to tell white lies or lies that will be help you that will be helpful to you or lies that are convenient? Okay, so basically with experience corollary, the main idea of this in simple language is that we learn to question our own belief. And if we question them, do you think it will be helpful if we change them? Well, that depends. Sometimes we question our belief, but at the end of the day, we keep those beliefs or we continue holding onto those beliefs. Okay? So with experience corollary, this gives way to possible changes. But with experience corollary, we are not yet changing them. We are still in the stage that we are questioning them. Okay, because if we change our beliefs, that's now in the modulation corollary. So basically, a review of what we have talked about. First, we construct our beliefs in construction. And next, we question our beliefs with experience. And then eventually, we learn to change our beliefs with what we call modulation. So let's talk about modulation. Okay, so according to Kelly, modulation corollary refers to ident modifying our constructs as a function of new experience. So um, its keyword is permeability, or if you say that something is permeable, it means that it is, it is something that is open to new ideas. It is penetrable. You can insert new ideas to your mindset. So if you have a fixed mindset, what's your mindset? Is it fixed or is it growth mindset? Okay, so that's a related concept to this one. So with modulation corollary, you are done with the stage for in you question your belief because in modulation, you are now changing your beliefs in a healthy or unhealthy way. So it's important for you to change your belief in a healthy manner. See, for example, you may have a construct that failing means you're a failure. So if you're score in a quiz is a failing mark then it means that you're a failure but now that you are an adult and you're no longer a student you're thinking if i fail in what i'm doing does it necessarily mean that i'm a failure and your therapist or maybe you yourself will realize that yes i fail but i am not a failure okay so it's important for you to adapt certain changes to your beliefs and let's talk about more shallow ideas say for example your construct when you were a child is that santa will go to my place on christmas eve and santa will give me gifts okay but as an adult you know that you healthily know that it is not santa who brings gifts on christmas because Imagine an adult believing that Santa is the one who brings gift on Christmas, then he or she would would appear to be childish or unhealthy in the cognitive, in the personal constructs theory perspective. It's also about changing your misconceptions, such as along the way since our society has helped us adapt, we are we have changed our views, we have been able to change our misconceptions. Say for example modulation has been helpful in in changing our views and changing our beliefs so in preventing sexism racism and preventing discrimination because we learn to question the beliefs that our parents had hence we are no longer adapting those beliefs say for example maybe you used to believe that technology is bad but it's not so bad after all if technology is helping is being helpful to our learning right so that is modulation corollary, being able to realize that you should be able to change your belief if it's appropriate to do so. So let's talk about another, another possible example. Say, for example, when you were a child, your parent told you that don't talk to strangers. But as an adult, let me ask you, is that a healthy belief to keep that you should not talk to strangers? Of course not, because 
as an adult, if you don't talk to strangers, then how are you supposed to survive? Especially if it's really needed for you to talk to strangers in a certain situation. So I discussed this first three because they are connected to each other. First, we construct our belief, our own beliefs, and then eventually we try to challenge them with experience, and then eventually we will change them with modulation. Okay, and the key word of modulation is permeability. Okay, so right now think about your own beliefs that you have changed along the way and ask yourself, is it healthy if I change my belief in this way or should I have should I have keep holding on to my old beliefs? Okay, so that's for the first three and let's move on. Okay, the next construct is called individuality. So when we say individuality corollary, Kelly believes that people perceive events in different ways. So you have your own views. And this is one of the hallmarks of George Kelly's theory. He's saying that we have our own beliefs. Okay, so maybe in your perspective, criminals are bad, but in the perspective of the criminals, they're not so bad after all because they're doing that for their family. What if their family is hungry? Individuality can also explain our preferences. Say, for example, you like hamburger but your neighbor doesn't like hamburger or you like pizza, but other people don't like pizza. It's because your construct is that pizza is good or pizza is delicious, delicious, but it doesn't mean that everybody needs to believe that pizza is delicious. So that is individuality corollary. You have your own views. That's why you endorse different candidates in the election. You have your own favorite food. You have your own favorite movie because we do have our own perspectives in different situations and that is individuality corollary so let's move on to other constructs the next is dichotomy corollary in short kelly believes that constructs are bipolar so if you listen carefully to my introduction in this lecture i've already given you an overview about this so basically kelly believes that in order for your belief to be useful you should know the opposite of that belief okay so in order for you to tell me that that your parent is responsible, you should know what an irresponsible parent is. Okay, so basically in everything that you do or everything that you describe, you know it's opposite. That's why that construct, that adjective, that belief is very useful. Okay, so let me give you more examples in the next slide. Okay, so we do have a lot of constructs in our in our minds and we know the opposites of these constructs. So, for example, the most basic belief that if there's good, there's bad or evil. If something is easy, then it is not difficult. If someone is old, then he is not young. It may also apply to the brands that you use. Say, for example, you ask people, what do you like, Nike or Adidas? Original or fake? Okay. Responsible or irresponsible? Okay. Delicious or not delicious? Okay, so, um, loving or not loving, respectful or not respectful. So we all have constructs in our mind and we know the opposites of our beliefs. Okay, so in that way, our beliefs are useful because we categorize our experiences. Say, for example, you know that bad is the opposite of good. Hence, you know that an experience is good or you know that it's bad. And basically, we, it's like a spider web or a connection of events. Like you connect, if you think that something is good, you, you categorize it as good. And if you think that something is bad, you categorize it as bad. And basically, that's what you're going to learn when we move on to the next one. And the next one is what we call organization corollary. Next, we have what we call organization corollary. So it says that we arrange our constructs and patterns according to our views of their similarities and differences. Okay, so this is the next one after dichotomy because with dichotomy, we have a lot of opposing beliefs in our minds. But with organization, we try to connect related beliefs to each other. Okay, so now let's begin. In the Philippines, we have what we call the dichotomy between McDonald's and Jollibee. Okay, so there are people who like going to McDonald's and there are people who like going to our local fast food called Jollibee. And this is a, an example of a dichotomy. 
Okay, so what do you like? Is it McDonald's or Jollibee? So, so now, now, how do we make this unorganized belief? You do know that both of them sell chicken, but they have their own names for their chicken meal. Okay, so McDonald's called their own meal as Chicken McDo, while Jollibee called it Chicken Joy. And we know that they are connected. So now, instead of dichotomy, they have become an organized belief because now we are connecting our beliefs to each other. Okay. Next, we also know that both of them sell hamburgers. They both sell burgers. That's why Jollibee, they call their burger meal as Yum Burger, while McDonald's call it Burger McDo. Okay. And what's the difference between organization and dichotomy? In dichotomy, you do know that for every belief, there's an opposite, okay? But with organization, you connect the beliefs to each other, okay? They're now connected to each other. So the key word for organization is hierarchy. So why did it become a hierarchy? Because what do you put on top? On top, you put the beliefs that are, you put the bigger ideas on top while you put the specifics as you go down. You put the very specific ideas at the bottom, okay? So that is organization corollary, and that's just my first example. So dichotomy and organization are connected to each other, okay? Here is another example. The dichotomy between English and Tagalog, okay? English are local language. So how do we make our beliefs organized? So... In English, it's who. In Tagalog, it's sino. And you know which belongs to which. You know that sino belongs to Tagalog and who belongs to English. Next, you know that the Tagalog ano is the counterpart of the English word what. So on and so forth. Okay? And you don't mix up things. Okay? You don't say that bakit belongs to English and why belongs to Tagalog because you know that why is English and you know that bakit is Tagalog. So that just proves that your beliefs or your ideas are organized in a way that they make sense. Okay? And that is a that is a proof that there is such thing as organization corollary because even simple things such as the language that you spoke every day, you organize them in a meaningful pattern. Okay, so that's another example of organization corollary. Okay, so which part of this example is dichotomy? The dichotomy here is that you know that the counterpart of what is ano and the counterpart of why is bakit. What makes this organization is that we know that why belongs to English, how much belongs to English, what belongs to English, and these words on the right belongs to Tagalog. Okay, so that is the organization corollary example. So let's go to the next one. Here's another example. So a brand, a product can be original or fake. So we know that if it's original, it's supposed to be expensive. And if it's fake, it's supposed, it's supposed to be sold at a lower price or it's cheap. Okay. And we know that if it's fake, it's low quality. And if it's original, it's high quality. Okay, so you organize your beliefs, uh, your beliefs in or between original or fake. Okay, that's why you know that whenever you're looking at a product, you have your guidelines. So you look, is this expensive? Is this high quality? Because that's your, um, that's your guiding beliefs in order for you to say that something is original. Because if something, if someone sells something for a low price or if it's low quality then you immediately think that maybe this is fake, okay? So maybe you're not so conscious about these beliefs in the first place, but because of this discussion, you were able to become conscious that we have such beliefs in our mind, and now it all makes sense, okay? So try to make your own, or your own framework, okay? That's my challenge to you after this lecture. Why don't you create your own example? So how do you organize your belief okay, in your your beliefs in your everyday life, okay? The next is choice corollary, okay? So we have already discussed dichotomy and organization. Because of dichotomy, we know the opposite of our beliefs. 
because of choice, we, because of organization, we have organized our beliefs. And now we're talking about choice. And when we say choice, we choose the alternative that works for us. In other words, you choose the better option. Okay, so what's the difference between choice and dichotomy? In dichotomy, you're aware of the choices. You know that you have opposing beliefs, but in choice, this time you know that you have to choose. Okay, now you are selecting. Okay, so say for example, if you want something original, then you look for something that is sold for a high price because at the same time, it has high quality. If you choose something that is a counterfeit or something that is fake, then you're also choosing something that is cheap or low quality. So if you want something high quality, then go for original. But if you want something that is cheap, then go for a fake one. Okay, so that's an example of choice corollary. So we do use choice corollary in everyday behavior. So if you would like to eat chicken McDo, then go to McDonald's, don't go to Jollibee. If you would like to, to do good, then you're going to help. If you don't like to do good, then you're not going to help that person. Okay, so we use choice corollary in everyday life. Here's another example of choice corollary. So you do know that good is the opposite of bad. And if you want to become a good person, you're going to be honest. And if you want to become a bad person, and then you're not going to be honest or you're going to lie. So, so take, see for example, let's talk about studies. Or you're going to take a test. So if you want to be a good person, you're going to study well. But if you're a bad person, then you're going to cheat. Okay? So that defines as a, as a person. So what are your choices? Are you choosing to be a good person? Or are you choosing things that will make you a bad person? Okay, so basically we, we choose the alternative that works for us. And the alternative that works for you may have a lot to do with what have worked for you in the past. Okay, see for example, as a good person, you know that studying is better than cheating. But in the perspective of the bad person, he might say that I'm going to cheat because I don't like to study because studying takes a lot of effort. Okay, that's why you need to be able to, to be a good example to your future children or to, to your colleagues. Okay, so this is another example. So basically with choice, you choose what works for you. Okay, so am I going to walk or am I going to take the car? Am I going to go outside or, or am I going to stay at home? Am I going to pursue a career in music or am I going to pursue a career in psychology? Am I going to watch TV or am I going to read the newspaper? Okay. Am I going to eat alone or am I going to eat with my friends? So every day we make choices and we weigh our choices in a way that you want to choose something that works for you, okay? So that's one other example for choice corollary. Now let's go to fragmentation. And so basically we have already discussed dichotomy, organization, choice corollary. Now this time, let's talk about fragmentation. And when we say fragmentation, sometimes we have contradictory or inconsistent constructs. See, for example, here in the Philippines, you do know that if it's July, it's rainy. If it's April, it's sunny. That's our organization of events. But how does it become fragmentation? When we say fragmentation, these are contradictory or inconsistent constructs. See, for example, here's the example of fragmentation. There are times that even though it's summer, it rains. And there are times that even though it's July, it's so warm in the Philippines. And that is fragmentation. Why? Because it just, it just doesn't make sense. Because if it's July, it's supposed to be rainy. And if it's April, it's supposed to be sunny. Then why is it that is the other way around? That's an example of fragmentation. Whenever you have beliefs that are inconsistent okay, or contradictory, Here's another example. 
when you are eating outside or when you're going to eat, you know that if you if you buy something that is low cost or if you did not spend so much on what you're going to eat, then don't expect that it's going to be delicious. Okay, it's not going to be that yummy because it's low price. But if you spend a lot on your food, then expect that it's supposed to be delicious. However, how how does that become fragmentation? It becomes fragmentation if it's contradictory. What if you spent you spent so much on your food, but it's not delicious? Did that happen to you before? Okay, have you experienced that before? That you have spent a lot of money on that dessert, but at the end of the day, you did not like it. On the other hand, there are instances wherein you only spent like ten or twenty pesos on your food. But it's more delicious than something that you will buy at an expensive rate. Okay, so that is fragmentation. There are times that our beliefs are inconsistent. Here's one example. They say that, according to my friend, they say that there are instances wherein people in the prison are religious, they're kind, but people outside the prison, they are not so religious. That's why they are somehow confused with that experience why is it that when they went to prison when they observe the people attending the sunday mass or sunday service they are so responsive they are so um they listen attentively because that did not fit with their initial belief that they thought that criminals are not supposed to be religious but they realized that criminals can be religious as well okay or convicts can be religious as well okay so that's an example of fragmentation. Maybe it's trying to teach us something, okay? That not all people who are who be, who are considered criminals are bad, okay? And not all people outside the prison are considered good, okay? So that is fragmentation corollary, okay? Sometimes our beliefs may be inconsistent, or sometimes they may be um, contradictory, okay? So think of the times so where in your experience fragmentation corollary in your life okay now let's talk about range corollary so when we say range corollary our constructs may be applied to many situations or they may be limited to a single situation or person so it may sound complex but range corollary is something easy to understand okay so look at this let me remind you of your lessons back when you were in elementary so you have you learned about adjectives right and when you learn about adjectives you learn that there are adjectives for people there are adjectives for objects there are adjectives for feelings there are adjectives for animals etc so basically that's the main idea here so take a look at the first example here can you use the word empathic to describe a person of course yes but can you use the word empathic to describe a table of course not, because empathic is not a word that can be used to describe a table because empathic is a is an adjective for people. So that's range corollary. So basically, our beliefs are not useful all the time because there are limits and instances wherein we get to use these beliefs. We can only use a certain belief to describe a person and not an object. So let me go to an, to a more shallow example here. So let's take a look at this. You can use the word tall to describe a person, to describe a building, okay? To describe a to describe someone you know, he or she is tall. But can you use tall to describe internet connection? Of course not. But rather when describing an internet connection, you use the word fast or slow. So that is another example of range corollary. Okay. And here's another here are two more corollaries. So the first is called commonality. So I hope you remember individuality that we talked about earlier. So with individuality, basically you have your own perspective in looking at things, okay? But when we say commonality, it says that even though people are different, at the end of the day, we may have very similar beliefs, okay? So people in compatible groups may have a similar belief or construct. So you may... See, here's an example of a commonality corollary. See, for example, you hate a person for your own reason. So you hate person A because you think person A is lazy. 
your other classmate hate person A because he thinks person A is um, is not friendly. So you hate person A and your classmate hate person A, but for your for different reasons. So that is individuality. When we say commonality, even though you have your own reasons to hate person A, at the end of the day, both of you hate person A. So at the end of the day, even though you have your own beliefs, you may have similarities in those beliefs because you came from the same group. So this is Kelly's way of explaining culture. Yes, there are 110 million Filipinos in the country, but even though you have your own beliefs, at, there are instances wherein we endorse the same culture and we may not be so conscious about it. So that's commonality, okay? Even though your beliefs are unique, we find similarities in our beliefs, okay? And lastly, we have what we call sociality corollary. So with sociality, we try to understand how other people think so we can change our behavior accordingly. And let me use myself as an example for this one, for sociality. So basically, this is how Kelly explain how we behave in certain situations. So say, for example, how does sociality work? Say, for example, this is the situation. In school, I behave as a teacher because I know that other people think of me as a teacher. On the other hand, in front of my friends, I behave as their friend because that's how they think of me. In front of stranger, I behave like a stranger because that's how they think of me. But in front of my teachers in masteral, I behave as their student because that's how they think of me. Basically, we try to understand how, how do other people think of us and we behave in a way that is consistent with their beliefs. So basically, sociality allows us to understand how should we behave in a certain situation. That's why you behave differently in front of your parents and in front of strangers. Okay, so that's for sociality corollary. So here is the sum summary of the 11 corollaries that we talk about today. And I have already uploaded readings in our online classroom that will allow you to understand further what we have talked about in this discussion. So basically, I hope that even though this theory is complex, you were able to understand the constructs or the corollaries of George Kelly by using the examples that I have given to you. And my challenge to you is to create your own examples so that you'll be able to use Kelly's theory in everyday situations. Okay, may that be in politics, may that be in behavior, may that be in your everyday beliefs or your everyday choices. But at the end of the day, you create beliefs and you try to behave in ways that are consistent in your with your beliefs. So that is it for the 11 corollaries of George Kelly and I hope that you learned a lot from this discussion. Okay, so that's it and thank you.